everybody, welcome back. Uh, I'm going to introduce um, our panel moderator, um, and then we're going to do some movement activity, um, and then we're going to go move on to our panel. Uh, Cassandra McKay Jackson is associate, an associate professor and director of the Master's in Social Work program at Eckerson Institute. Eckerson Institute was one of the first institutions in the country to focus on the, on the importance of the child, childhood early, early years and houses the nation's premier graduate school in child development and works to ensure that all children have equitable opportunities to each to reach their potential through education, research, and service to children and families and advocacy. Dr. McKay Jackson has more than 24 years of experience as a licensed clinical social worker, providing therapeutic services to youth and families in patient and outpatient and school settings. She's, she also has managed the statewide training and development of the Central Baptist Family Services, One Hope United, and Child Welfare Agency located, a child welfare agency located in several states across the country. Um, Kate Jackson has a PhD in education from the University of Illinois at Chicago, right here, um, and a master's in science degree in social work from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Her scholarship focuses on the development and analysis of school-related interventions, which encourage youth social responsibility and results. Interdisciplinary in nature, McKay's work links education and social work practice to investigate the impact that classroom interventions and school climate have on academic success and social and emotional learning of marginalized youth. She has written and presented internationally as well as nationally on the on the impact of critical services, critical service learning as a school social work intervention. During her seven year tenure at the University of Illinois Chicago, Jane Adams College of Social Work, she was promoted and tenured, chaired or supported 23 doctoral dissertations and was a recipient of the UIC Teachers Recognition Award, as well as the Jane Adams College of Social Work Award for Excellence in Social Work Education. And she's also a good dancer. Let's welcome Sandra K. Jackson. Thank you. So, what we're going to do here is rise. Yeah, and what I want to do, just because one of the hour of the day, you all have had a magnificent lunch. <laughs> We get a little bit sleepy. So in order for us to re-engage, we're going to do a little bit of movement, but then how this connects to what we've been talking about um, all day deals with personhood and community. So I'm going to show you a piece, just just small movement, no fast box, 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 Chicago, and that. But we're going to do it individually, and then we're going to do it together. Okay, so individually meaning that you can stand wherever you are. When we come together, we're just going to come into like a little cluster. It means that you just come from your room and you come closer together and do the same movement. We're going to do it once. I'm going to show you kind of the count. Second time, I'll show you it in a syncopated fashion. So we'll have one, two, three, four, like a ripple effect. And then we'll see if we can do it together in a community. Yeah? Okay. Uh, easy cheesy. All right, so come on. Come on in. All right, so very simple. All right, so everybody just get nice, good, straight posture, standing flat on the floor, hands down to the side. The movement is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we're going to reverse it. One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Easy, right? Let's try that one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Reverse. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good? All right. Let's try that all together. Then I'm going to give you syncopated rhythm and then I'm going to try it all as a group. So all together, one more time. Ready, and one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, here's what I'm going to ask. This is the patient. Can I have one more folk here? How one row folk here? And we got maybe one row folk here. Anybody going to join this row? Great. One row up here. And one row up here. So we should have four rows. Right? Okay, here's your syncopation. Still, you're in your own individual. We haven't come to a group yet, but we're getting closer. You're going to start one, two. You'll have, you'll have the easiest. Because you're going to start on one. You all will start on three. We'll do the same thing. Okay? You all. Okay, we're all. Okay, so then we'll start on five. Okay? I'm going to count out for you. It's almost like a row, 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 you both, but with, 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 with bodies. Ready? And one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four. Did you come to leave it there? We're just going to do it one more time. We're going to do it one time through. One time through. So you know your count? So when I call three, that's your one. When I call five, that's your one. Okay, and you finish the whole cycle, so you have two counts of eight. Ready? One more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. So just once you finish your whole cycle, stop. Once you finish your whole cycle, stop. Okay? One more time, and then we'll come to a cluster. Ready? <laughs> Ready? One more time. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. Very good. All right, let's come in just a little bit. And so usually, how many people have seen, um, well, Alvin Ailey is very known for this kind of cluster. They have a, their signature pieces, uh, Revelations. So the opening piece, there's a cluster and then they break off. So because we're a little limited in space, we're probably not going to do that much of a cluster. We'll come in just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. We want to kind of make this community. All right? <laughs> Yeah, if you want to fill in, fill in where there's spaces. <laughs> we're just we're gonna just take the R's. I, I see there's some dancing and food. You don't want to hurt me because we have not stretched at all. <laughs> okay. We are really touched you though. <laughs> okay. So now what has happened? Again, bringing us back to the conversations that have happened over the course of the day. You've been your individual person, right? Your individual with your individual timing. Now we bring it back together as a symphony, as a community, because everybody has something different to offer. Everyone has something different to contribute. And so this is how we try and make this something bigger than what it was when you were just by yourself, right? Talk about isolation how you bring some health back to the community by people connecting back together. Okay, that was all wonderful. Let's see if we can figure out this count. Ready? Who, now, so the folks who had one, you're still good, right? Folks who had, you started on three, where are you all? Awesome, folks who started on five, where are you all? Okay, we ready? Okay. We're still starting. You're still starting. Well, how about this? You're a little bit closer together. We're going to do it all once together, that whole sequence, and then we'll break up into the ripple. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, all once together, 
and then we'll break up into the rhythm. Five, six, ready, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one, two, three, four, five. Let's do that again. That looks beautiful. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here we go. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two three, four, five, six, seven, and one, two, three, four, five, six. Try it again. And one, two, and one, two, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and hold. Beautiful. Well done. Well done. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get started with our panel, and um, we'll start first with Kathy, who's going to share a little bit about her work, and then we'll move on to Leah, and then Jennifer, we've already presented, so you'll just share a little bit, and then we'll start with, you want to bring back the question that was posed um, at uh, Jennifer's presentation, we want to bring that back to the panel and then we'll continue to open up the floor for questions from the audience. So first is Kathy. Uh, so my name is Kathy Kreisner. I work here at UIC. I'm an occupational therapist and I'm um, a, a clinical associate professor and academic field coordinator of the Department of Occupational Therapy here at UIC. Um, and among some other scholarly interests, one of the things that I've become very interested in in the last few years is the um, origins of occupational therapy as a profession here at Hull House. It's really where, it, um, there's, there's an article that is titled Embryo Embryonic Startings or something like that of Occupational Therapy at Hull House. And that, that's the piece I'm really, really interested in and what I'm going to share with you today. Um, and I did participate uh, pretty recently about a year or so ago now, um, with Cassandra, um, in the um, Securing the Common Good, which was a year-long faculty institute here at the Jane and Jane Adams Hull House. Um, I also want to mention that I have a family connection to not just the Hull House, but to arts in Hull House. So I'm the great, great niece of um, someone who, of of a very, uh, someone who became a famous dancer. Um, he went by Vincenzo Celli, but to us he was just Uncle Jimmy, and I don't know where Jimmy came from Vincenzo, but anyway, that's what we called him. Um, and I did meet him. Uh, he was actually just a little bit older than my grandfather, so I did meet him. So he came from Salerno, Italy, to Chicago with his family. He was four years old. And um, he was working as an usher in a theater somewhere in Chicago. I don't know where that was. I'm going to try to dig up that information. But um, he saw ballet. And there's a quote, actually, it's in, in his obituary in the Chicago Tribune. There's a quote that he said, I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was great. And so he came to Hull House and learned um, how to dance. Also was very involved in the theater here, too. Um, and eventually became an internationally known Italian-American dancer, ballet. Um, teacher and choreographer, um, both in Italy and in New York. So I feel like my pull to Hull House is both professional and personal. Um, and I think for me, it also just says so much, so much about how Hull. You know, I have this family story about how Hull House and the arts at Hull House helped to transform lives. So that's related to what I'm going to be talking about today. So what I'm hoping to convey during this presentation is how the beginnings of occupational therapy education were rooted in, in both progressive ideas and also how they were linked to the social services that were um, part of the mission or the mission of Hull House. And then talk a little bit about how therapeutic work, including um, the use of arts, were central in the training of what are called attendants, and I'll explain what that is. So all of what I'm talking about today is before occupational therapy became a profession in and of itself. So the profession officially started in 1917. We just had our centennial 
um, last year as a profession. All of this stuff started in 1907, though, so even before that time. But that's really where our roots are. So it all started with the Chicago School of Civics and Philanthropy. So as many of you know, this um, the Chicago School of Civics and Philanthropy grew out of the set settlement movement. Um, and really, the, the one of the overall purposes of it was to join the emerging field of social work education with the actual work of social work. Um, so it, that, or, the organi organization itself was started in 1908. And um, its founders, directors, and trustees included a lot of people from University of Chicago and a lot of people from Hull House. And actually, by looking at one, the very first yearbook over there, I was able to answer a question I've had for a little while now, which is why we, as occupational therapists, we say that Hull House is our roots when it was a Chicago School of Civics and Philanthropy, and I knew they were very much intertwined and related. But in their early years, they didn't have physical space. So they, because so many of the people on the board and um, um, and so many people that were involved in the Chicago School were Hull House people too. They did a lot of their work here initially and had meetings here. So, um, so again, its founders, directors, trustees, both from the University of Chicago faculty and also reform women from Chicago's Hull House, most notably um, Julia Lathrop and Jane Addams. So there's this strong connection between the organization and Klaus itself. Um, a very early important function of the Chicago School of Civics and Philanthropy was to provide training for local, state, and federal employment. And that's where this idea of training attendance came out of. Um, so the Chicago School was particularly concerned about the conditions, or one of their concerns was about the conditions in mental health institutions at that time. They were usually called asylums. Um, so much so that one of their very first initiatives was to address this problem by training these attendants to go into um, the asylums and to work with the patients there. So the organization was started in 1908, and this, this um, month-long course to train attendants that I'll share information about with you um, was offered in the summer. So they, got, they either were thinking about this before the organization was fully developed or developed it very quickly, and it just says to me that it was a really important first goal or one of their first important goals that they wanted to deal with. Um, just to give a little background, this is a time before there were any psychotropic medications. Often people with severe mental illnesses or even mild mental illnesses would spend very long periods of time in asylums. Um, or spend their whole life in an asylum. They were um, often warehoused and weren't engaged in a lot of activities. And so that's where we can see where a lot of the current concerns came out of. So um, improving conditions in the asylums by engaging people in meaningful activities, which as occupational therapists, we call occupations. So we define occupation as a purposeful and meaningful activity for that individual. So that could be art. That could be getting back to driving after some sort of an accident. It could be a, a child being able to be fully participatory in a classroom, really any of those kinds of things. Um, and I mean, where I see the connection between that and social reform is that the reformers really knew and believed that psychiatric patients were worthy of better care um, and to, were deserving of easing suffering, and that getting them more engaged and more involved in purposeful activity really brought dignity to a group of individuals who, unfortunately, were not in that kind of situation. Um, so I want to share a quote here. Um, it says, the modern attitude, just to give kind of more context about how we were, the attitudes towards people with mental illness. So the modern attitude toward the care of the insane is that they are sick persons who, whose care should be in the hands of physicians and trained nurses. But insofar as their minds have become warped and dull, they, they should be re-stimulated by occupation, instruction, and amusement. So to address those concerns that I mentioned, the Chicago School started offering an annual summer course, a month-long summer course, for the attendants. So the attendants were really the people who spent the most time with patients on the boards. So um, even more time than the nurses did. So they felt that the training should really go to those individuals because they're the ones who are going to have the most contact. And that's what this was. Oh, and on the right, 
is um, a bulletin or a little announcement about the, or the 1909 course um, that was offered. So in the summer, they offered some courses that were about um, social work and social movements. And each year, one of those courses was about training attendance. And we had people come, people came from all over the country, especially from the East Coast and in the Chicago area to attend these courses. So the attendant is a constant companion of the patient, and upon his or her ingenuity and wisdom, the success of the work of re-education must depend in large measure. So the occupations courses taught the attendants how to engage patients yeah. in occupation or meaningful productive activity as a way to positively influence their health and wellness. Um, and so the quote in the bubble is a quote from that time. More, a more contemporary quote from, I believe, the 60s, uh, Mary Riley was a very well-known occupational therapist and, and professor at the University of Southern California. Um, and this is probably the most known quote uh, amongst occupational therapists, which is, man, through the use of his hands, as they're energized by mind and will, can influence the state of his own health. And so that's really our philosophy as occupational therapists and, and other professions, um, of course, as well, um, that you know, what we do influences who we are, how we are, how we feel about ourselves and our own health. And that means that engaging in meaningful activity is very powerful. And when you think about people sitting in an asylum doing nothing versus then these attendants start working with them and getting them engaged, um, imagine how that would be a change. So let me give some information about these courses themselves. I mentioned they're, they were a month long. They included lecture, also practical instruction in handicraft and occupation, and I have a slide that gets more specific than that. And then they went to visit, they visited sites in the community here in Chicago. And on, I think it's the next, yeah, on the next slide, I'll give more specifics. Um, it was described as an experiment, it was ex described as experimental at the beginning, and I love this, an adventure in a new field. And they were right because the field of occupational therapy came out of it. Um, and the lectures were delivered by very prominent people, um, community experts, leaders in the social reform movement. Even um, Jane Addams gave one of the lectures um, in, in the first and in subsequent years. And there's a quote that's from a yearbook, not one of these, but I came across one in the University of Chicago archives where it said, and I love this quote too, the list of lecturers is proof in and of itself, in itself, of the importance attached to this new endeavor. So I hope, I know, that's small. Well, I'll read some of it. Um, so this is the schedule of work. This is basically what the, the uh, students learned about in that month, um, month long course. So they had lectures by, like I said, pretty prominent people, Jane Addams, Alice Hamilton, Graham Taylor. So they um, listened to lectures each morning for an hour. And then they spent a couple hours on handicraft activities. And these, between those and the games, some of which are also definitely art forms, they really spent the vast majority of their time learning about and talking and doing uh, art. So since it's probably hard to read, I'll read a few of the handicraft excuse me, handicraft activities that they did. So um, paper and cardboard construction, modeling and plastina clay, lessons in color. And so for each of these, it looked like they spent about a week on each topic. Um, knotting and twine, braiding, I won't read all of them, um, and basket weaving. And then some of the games that they did, I'll highlight a few. So some of them were more exercise, rhythmic exercises. Folk dances of various nations, so you can see how that was very relevant here at Hell House and that they were, I'm assuming, taking advantage of things that were already occurring here. Um, competitive games, ball games, um, folk dances. So um, you can see that there's a wide variety and it's very, very much linked to those. There's anything else. Yeah. So at the bottom it says what the trips were, so they went to the Art Institute, the Field Columbia Museum, so the Field Museum, Detention Home, home School, the Crane Nursery, Parks and City Playgrounds, Hull House. So there's one of my biggest questions is where physically did they 
offer this. That's so far I haven't been able to find that. And the fact that they say that they did a trip to Hull House makes me think I wasn't physically here. They must have been somewhere else. Um, and to the North Shore, they said, and will be um, taken in some of the afternoons. So there were a lot of accolades for the first occupation courses that I was able to find in some of the research that I did. Um, it was highly successful. It was said to, quote, be highly appreciated by the students and the superintendents under whom they served. So the superintendents being um, the workers in the mental health institutions. And the course was not only popular among the groups of students who were here and the people who taught, but it gained national wide attention. Um, in 1908, their JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, had an issue which described how innovative the program was. And um, I'll read you a quote from that. It said, many a patient just emerging from a depressive stage, many restless patients who, for who lack of occupation become dangerous, may greatly help be helped by judici judiciously planned work. Um, and it was also said that the course helped develop a new phase of life in institutions. Um, so again, remember this is a time when there aren't psychotropic drugs, there wasn't a lot of effective treatments for people who had, had mental illness. Um, and really until this social movement began, um, you know, there weren't a lot that these folks were being offered. So the courses themselves were offered several summers in a row. And eventually, because of the su success and because of it being widespread, um, it turned into the, the profession of occupational therapy, which, like I said, started in 1917. Um, and also, the very first, the Chicago School for Civics and Philanthropy, instead of just offering one summer course, they created the Henry B. Fable School of Occupations. And so that was really known in our profession to be the first official training program or training school um, of occupational therapists. And occupational, or art continues to be an important part of occupational therapy, but I would say less so than it used to. It kind of changes over time. So like in the 70s, occupational therapists were using um, more art than maybe in the 60s, and it kind of just changes with what's going on. Um, you know, in society in general, really our goal is not necessary to not necessarily to always use art, but is more to get people back to doing meaning things that are meaningful for them. So for example, I don't know how to knit, but when I was working clinically with patients who had strokes, it wasn't unusual for someone to say, I'd like to be able to knit again, and can you help me find a way to, to do this even though my hand isn't fully functioning? So. Um, we would get involved these days with art when it's a goal of a person to get back to something or, or to do something new if it involves art. But it might also, like other things we do is help people to be able to cook a meal again or take care of their grandchild again. Or some occupational therapists um, are certified driving rehab um, people that they can help people you know, find adaptive ways or learn how to drive again or see if they're safe driving again. So it really, it runs the whole gamut, so art is still part of what we do, um, but not necessarily a focus like it was in those early courses. So the top left picture is, um, well I should say too, when World War I happened, our focus as a field really became to be doing a lot of rehabilitation, especially physical rehabilitation of um, injured soldiers coming back from the war. So that picture up there is some patients in a mental health institution that had made toys. And so they're displaying the toys that they had made as part of their therapy. Um, there's a picture there of using pottery. The one on the top right is um, the use of looms. And actually, when I started working at Alexian Brothers um, Medical Center in Elk Grove Village, we still had a loom and used it sometimes with our patients. Um, the bottom left is a patient with a spinal cord injury who's using a craft to help regain hand function. And then the picture to the right is just a display of some handicrafts that occupational therapy patients made. And then the last one is a little girl painting um, with her occupational therapist. So, so I think kind of one of the take home messages to me is just how important art was in those very early um, times for our profession and how the, this 
theme of positively influencing health and well-being has really remained throughout the entire time. To me, it, it, I don't think this would have happened if we didn't have the Presbyter and the social movements that were occurring at the time that really said, "What's going on in these mental asylums is not okay. You know, these people have dignity; they're worthy of doing and not just sitting, um, and that we can use the." powers of engaging in activity as a way to help improve their mental health. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I like to hear people talk back, so feel free. Great. Hi. Awesome. Hey, we're here. Okay. Well, we're, those of us who are here who are here, my name is my name is Leah Gibson. Um, I am a faculty member in the art therapy department at the School of Arts in Chicago. Uh, I'm also program director now, and um, my work there uh, is really centered around looking at uh, art, ther art therapy through a cultural lens. Um, we share, I think, a lot of the uh, history with occupational therapy, I think um, our professions, the creative arts therapies, um, share a lot of this um, connection to the historical time in which the disciplines emerge. Um, and so much of my work is really spending time looking at when these ideas come about, what's happening in society, what's happening in the world, how are we understanding the people that are, that are called quote unquote patients or clients, or those who need to be quote unquote helped. Um, so I spend a lot of time interrogating those kinds of questions. So I will just leave it at that, and I'm excited to have this conversation with everyone. Hey, Jennifer. I always talk to you, know who I am. Jennifer Lasky, here at our institute at Minnesota uh, <laughs> University. We were just saying. Um, we don't know if we to see each other because we're so busy, but we're blocks away from one another and we are just making tension to do more collaborative work. So. so the first question I want to pose to the panel, and then we'll definitely open up the floor uh, for further questions, comes back from the previous presentation. And so I'll pose it in this way. What is normal and how does art defy or conform to that construct? I need to just say no. <laughs> and how does art defy or conform? Or conform? Well, we'll say and or conform to that construct. Okay. Well, uh, if, if I can just say that. Um, Normality is a construct. Mm -hmm. um, so, getting at this idea about culture at the core of what I'm looking at when I'm trying to understand or define art therapy, um, oftentimes normal is is sort of the view that there are some people who fall outside of a desired state of being well. Um, so wellness. Um, words today like wellness um, or healthy, um, the, the kind of, I would just say, colloquial ways of describing an ideal state of the human um, is, is kind of how we get this construct of normality. Um, now, this is really complicated because when we think about lived experience and when people are describing real problems and challenges that they're facing, um, and, and even the desire to just want to be normal, we should look at, or want to feel, or want to be normal, we should really look at what's being communicated there. Um, so in terms of thinking about the capacity of art to defy uh, normality as a construct is, is just allowing people the, to, the space to actually articulate um, the range of differences within humanity, so that there's a, a range of um, voca vocabularies that can become introduced when you offer more than one mode of expression. So if the dominant 
mode of expression is the way that I'm speaking to you now. Um, if also, and I would add language. So if the dominant mode of expression is English, um, it is um, speaking in a particular kind of um, cultural way of describing things. You know, I, I would, just came from the uh, Chicago International Film Festival, some of the movies there always remind me of how dialogue is so culturally determined, right? And how just communicating something really simple about how someone is feeling, you know, as an American, there are lots of words for everything. You know, you just spend a lot of time talking and explaining, you know, I'm watching this film, three minutes of the film, maybe five words, and I'm like, yeah, there's something there, right, outside of that. Um, verbal interaction. And so I think opening up the range of expression from what is considered normal is one way. Um, now, I think that most things conform to the dominant discourse, however. So I don't think that art has any special or particular gift at defying norms. I think we have to choose to defy norms. So art does not inherently defy anything. It's how we use art that, that allows it to then potentially defy that construct. I, to, to go off of it too is the term of neurodiversity is that there's a, a big spectrum of what, um, of what we, how we think, how we see the world uh, is a is very broad construct and, and that we, that person is on that spectrum is, is kind of key. And that's almost the same thing with, with art as well. That there is no good art, bad art, uh, or some formal way of determining that. It's, as we said earlier, we trust the process, and you, it's all about the process, but you're also trusting your client or patient, whomever, to show you the way based on um, their art and what they say about it. I'm gonna, oh, go ahead. So it's almost like you were going like this. It's almost like it's a, a rainbow. It's almost like it's infinite possibilities. So is there really a normal norm of it? Go ahead, Emily. Yes, please. You know, um, I'm hearing from all of you a far end of what is a spectrum in our culture that we are seeing now. And the range of diversity is embraced on one side, and then we have a very narrowness on another side. And um, I think we have both reached the ends <laughs> to where they both become this vision. Sometimes the end becomes the vision. Um, and I don't really see a solution to it exactly, but I don't think there's anything anyone can do in the arts now that would in any way be shocking. We can get Banksy uh, <laughs> doing his work and watch it and right. we videotape and it goes up three times the price. Or we can have the manager mm -hmm. and the artist to do it, stepping on the plan, mm -hmm. making a statement and looking for the artist. Um, there is nothing you can do. You can destroy your work in that heaven. That is how far the extreme is gone. Is there anything left? No. Yeah, you trying to figure it out. Is it a circle? Is there, <laughs> any, is there anything you can do? Circular. But I mean, uh, boy, it's okay. Uh, I think, I, I agree. I think we're still polarized. I, I think the question has to do with how we find commonality. Mm -hmm. and how we find the ability to uh, communicate and understand each other without mm -hmm. sacrificing and losing your individuality in the process. And I think that the function of art, therefore, potentially, is that it's a language. It is that it can, it, it's something that can transcend individuality, even though it's an expression of individuality. You know, I'm in theater, we always say, what do you need to do, collect? What do you need to uh, do? Minimum. You need two people. You need a performer, you also need an audience. Member. And a person by doing their own thing is not here. 
an audience just sit there and not do it. You will. I think it's about communication. So I, I'm intrigued with this. You know, I mean, the notion of norms and health, but it's also a question of, again, how do you respect and preserve individuality and difference? while at the same time finding common apps are not just each living in our own little silo, separate from each other, saying, oh yes, well, yeah, what do you call it, echo chambers? You know, well, I'm doing right by me, and, and the five people who are just like me, if I go in next week, I'll be only two of them. You know? How do you come back from this so that we can, we can form a, a, a community again that's inclusive, you know, of, of all that stuff? And respectful of all that stuff, and at the same time, say, with, with this give and take. You know, okay, I don't have to have all this. I, I, can, I, I'm willing to give this much up if it means that we will have communication and commonality and group instead of having to fight every little moment. And I think it's especially hard at this point in time, not just because we're very polarized as a nation and in well, the world um, in our views, um, but also just with. You know, technology, people being more isolated than ever, you know, the list could go on. We all know what those things are, and I think it's, it's a hard time to then try to come together collectively um, to make that happen. But I do think that there's the power of art to be an incredibly, and it is, I mean, not just to be, but it is um, a very powerful way to, to do it somehow. I'm a little confused yeah. <laughs> because that question that led to a thing about community and commonality, which seems at odds with presentations about how you know, our therapy and so forth was a tool for working with an individual, to have that individual come to grips with what we started from, his or her own problems, issues, or whatever, and that there's no, it, it's not about what is our public face as an artist? Those are two different things. So that extremes that I'm hearing about in some way, it seems to, to me at least, have very little to do with the therapeutic potential of art as you guys are expressing it in the clinical or other settings. So I wonder if, if we were to put it in the analogy of um, individual organs and the body. Right? And so if art therapy were to treat the individual organ, so the individual organ is now healthy, so that the whole body is healthy. And so it, it is a both and, as opposed to art therapy just serving the individual, that is a significant component to the health of the body. Right? If the individual component remains um, in ill health, how does that now perpetuate the illness of the entire body? And so there, I think there's there's the uh, the use of art as a therapeutic tool, the expression of art as a form of communication, and there are various parts of that whole conversation that's connected together. And I think I just, I don't think, and again, because the first thing you said was. I'm sorry. I, I I don't I don't think you can see the the woman behind you who's been raising her hand, and I just want to say that I've seen her raise her hand several times. So if we can actually go to her, that would be. What I'd like to do is bring back something from the earlier session and have been very helpful what you said about the occupation as opposed to uh, work. Because the occupation doesn't mean we're turning people to the workplace. Right, that right. is, that's very useful. My mother was an OT. And um, boy, it just puts some things in perspective. But I want to take the conventional meaning of the word occupation and say, let's talk a little bit about work, labor, art, practice, which were where the words we started with earlier. Mm -hmm. And so, how can we? gain an understanding of what your social labor is, or what individual occupation is, or what the value of the community of art making is, from what occupational therapy and art therapy can teach us. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if I can spell it down either. <laughs> can you just repeat again what you said about 
occupation before it's occupation. Yeah, so, so the word occupation in our profession really means to be engaged in meaning, things that are meaningful and of value to an individual, um, which we all really have our own definition of because of all the differences that human beings have. Um, also, the, the opportunities we are or are not afforded in our environment influences what we do and what we want to do. Um, so, yeah, we really define that. It's almost an unfortunate, I don't know, it, 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 we have our own definition in a way of our work, of that word, but it's really evolved over time because the idea was originally to occupy people in doing, which some people did not have access to because of mental illnesses, physical illnesses, etc. cetera. So, um, yeah. Just to, I may okay. interject because what I'm hearing is an echo of Lady Morris saying what makes labor art is the satisfaction mm -hmm. it provides to the maker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's work. And I said, like, whoa, you know, I, I can't, I can't grasp it all. So, whatever you guys want. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think the word, the word work, too, it, that also clearly has its own meanings, too. And I don't think of a lot of the things that I do or have done as an occupational therapist as always engaging people in things that are work, because to me, work doesn't always have inherent pleasure where some of the things that we use as modalities are helping people get back to the things that are meaningful for them um which takes work so i don't know it's all very circular i suppose um yeah i don't know you, you have me thinking a lot i'm not sure what else i'm going to think some more maybe you guys can help me out i've got a question for leah if, unless you wanted to respond to that okay um, can you talk about Cliff Joseph? Sure. Um, so I guess I, I'm a little bit of the odd <coughs> panelist um, in that my work um, and participation in this program is not directly connected to Hull House. Um, and so I come to this conversation kind of thinking broadly about um, art therapy as a discipline and the cultural time in which it emerges as a discipline. So Cliff Joseph um, is an art therapist um, who began around the time that the American Art Therapy Association was founded. Um, the first kind of meeting to form the association was in 69. 1969, and if, if there are folks in the room who were either around during that time or who know a little bit about what was going on in 1969, what led up to 1969, and then the subsequent uh, revolutions that were occurring at that time, I find this to be very significant if we think about the kinds of practices kind of to your point about practice and labor and what people are, are um, how people are thinking about art at the time and, and sort of professionalizing art. Um, I think that that is really important for us to understand any kind of contemporary conversation about participatory art or art that is connected to philanthropy or art that is connected to wellness, um, healing, any of those kinds of ideas. So Cliff Joseph uh, was a commercial artist. Uh, he was born in Panama and immigrated um, through Ellis Island with his parents at around age four. Um, and he's a World War II veteran. Um, to kind of make some connections here, Two of the more prominent founders of uh, art therapy, uh, Margaret Nomberg and Edith Kramer, were both here to escape the rise of the Nazis, and they founded the art therapy profession. Um, so for me, it's not insignificant um, what, what's happening around what people are doing when they start to define something like occupational therapy and especially thinking about how our therapy has this uh, relationship to occupational therapy when it comes to 
uh, veterans coming back from the war. Um, so I, I, I have to make all these refer cultural references as I'm talking to you about Cliff Joseph because this is why, for me, he's an important figure um, because his life, it, it really lets us know where we are in time when we get to 1969 and he's a part of uh, these conversations about beginning Amer the American Art Therapy Association, which is wanting to define itself outside or, or sort of adjacent to um, uh, psychiatry primarily, um, and really trying to figure out where does art therapy belong, where does it fit, who are our interlocutors, and I, I think that we haven't left that time period in history actually. I think our discipline really, really wants to leave that period behind, but I just don't think we're there yet. Um, and I think it's okay. Um, 1969 was not a long time ago. <laughs> um, and so for, for Cliff Joseph, in 1974, he uh, hosts a, organized a panel at the fifth American Art Therapy Association annual conference, and this the title of this panel is called Art Therapy in the Third World. So again, this is a, a, a term of the period, and this is about global revolution. Right? This is an acknowledgement of, of colonization, this is an acknowledgement of global class structure right, that is created by systems of government that it, that, that's not accidental. There's not a, a developed world as if there have not been a, a, a systematic underdevelopment, right, of other worlds, right? These are the kinds of critiques that people are already dealing with and working with at the time. So, so Cliff Joseph is, is one who comes forward in the 1970s having uh, come from a background, a military background, then coming here, practicing art. So let's remember what the laws were for people of color in this time, right, specifically for African Americans, also thinking about um, uh, the African diaspora, Caribbean Americans, and what those experiences were of the workplace, and what their options were. Let's think about women. Let's think about all of these things if we're going to understand what art therapy is. So um, this conversation that happened at this panel, Art Therapy in the Third World, is, is one that wants to say art therapy is, is a place to begin to speak to what's happening in our society. That the problems that people face are not divorced or separate from or independent of the world that we live in. So there, there's, there's no pure art or pure science or pure art science that can somehow address what people are living through without dealing with the material world that they're in. So that's a really long answer to the who is Cliff Joseph question, <laughs> but this, that's, that's where I enter, enter into the discussion. Is there another question on the floor? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna pose this question and maybe I'm gonna tag on another one to you and then we'll, I'm sure this is gonna generate further conversation. So cow, can cows be purple? We've, had, we've heard that question before. I'm gonna tag this on. What are practical ways that art promotes social change? So maybe there are, there are two separate questions, but I think can cows be purple dives deeper into something else. Well, I think from the occupational therapy perspective, I think just the fact that there was this training course that was teaching people to then go into the asylums and be engaging people who normally would not be engaged in very much activity, um, to have them all of a sudden be doing meaningful things, doing things where they're engaged, doing things where they experience pleasure. Um, I think that one way that that created social change, I'm imagining, I mean, certainly I wasn't there at the time, but um, when you start engaging people who are really seen as passive and maybe not being able to make their own choices um, in, in their own lives and to create their own paths, and then all of a sudden you're changing the culture within these, these places, um, there are people witnessing that who are 
doing other jobs within that same um, environment. And then when you start seeing people able to take more agency and be able to make more choices, I think that that's one way that you start chipping away at some social change, that you start changing the culture. I mean, it goes back to the question about norms. What are the norms? It was, no it was normal for most people to think that it was okay to just sit because you're so sick, you can't be out in society and you can't, even within the walls of where you're being warehoused, that you can't be um, engaging in things that are important to you, meaningful, and that you didn't have that, you know, you weren't worthy of the same things that other people are able to access when they don't have, when they're, when they're normal, quote unquote normal. Um, so I think that art and other activities that, pe that if we give people access to those things that they want and need to do, even if they need to do it in very different ways because of a disability, um, I think that really pushes the norms which then changes society or has the potential to change society depending on what's going on. And I think that everything you said about the context, like none of this work is done without considering the, the social context and the environment that we have because that influences who we are as people, what we think, what we believe is possible, what we think is impossible. Uh, yeah. uh, what comes to mind is Hegel's uh, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, and the notion that artists are often ahead of the spirit of the times, and often that's why they're not understood, usually in their lifetime or in, in that period of time when they're making their art. And there's all sorts of art artists that you can use as examples of that. So I think the notion that uh, looking for change sometimes begins with the making of art to start us questioning, you know, art, does art mirror your life? Or does life mirror art? It was a question. Well, it goes both ways. But the notion that um, sometimes art can be an agent of change within itself because it starts a dialogue and it helps us name something or put a name to an issue or a concern or a problem uh, that needs to be addressed. And oftentimes art art can be threatening, art can be scary, art can be hurtful, art can be all sorts of things. Underneath that, though, I think art is a catalyst in itself for change because it creates a reaction from people uh, and everyone has their own way of how they're interpreting it, but it starts this dialogue, um, not always, but I think that's the power of art. Okay, and then I have no others, two okay. other questions. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, these questions, I just want to say, are not short in <laughs> <laughs> uh, Because there are a lot of assumptions in the question, how can art be? I mean, my first thing is, well, what are we talking about when we say art? We're not even talking about the same thing, I can tell you. <laughs> I mean, there's art in 2018, there's art in 1974, there's art in 1908, there's art in 1517. So what are we talking about, first of all? Um, and then I think, I think we tend to be talking about art as some kind of creative expression, often privileging the visual, um, but we tend to be talking, especially in art therapy, we tend to be talking about visual, uh, some, some kind of visual expression that is recognizable as, as an act of creativity, so that that might be in, in materials or media that are part of an, an art institution that we recognize, so what material someone might use would then determine whether or not we can consider that art. Um, this is, can art be, is, I, I'm going to get stuck there, first of all, to try to answer that question. Um, but I, I'll go to the can cows be purple, mm -hmm. because I think it depends on who's painting the cows or who's imagining the cows. And so art, just like it is defined within a historical context, is, is defined based on uh, power structures. So who gets to decide what color the cows are? Um, who, you know, I think that there's a very individualistic thread in all of the therapies that come out of the US. Um, particularly art therapy um, 
and, and the way that we can value individual expression. Um, I would agree that uh, changing culture or the potential to change culture or, or the art of naming, the, a dialogue, those kinds of things are, are positive ways of using art um, to, to try to think about or push forward change. Um, at the same time, I, I really struggle with a more neoliberal conception of art that would suggest that creativity and expression does something about poverty, because it doesn't. So, you know, I struggle, I'm in that in-between space constantly as someone who's in the discipline, right? So my, my role is to really critique the discipline that I am in. When there are ideas that really want to celebrate art, as a singular thing that you know really is, is not one thing, um, and as something that has an inherent power, I tend to really want to question that and, and figure out what's our tendency toward that idea. What what maybe there are things that feel good about believing that art can change really difficult social problems that are a part of our history as, as a nation. Um, maybe there's something comforting about that, but I'd like just for us to get a little bit uncomfortable with the fact that we have some really hard work to do if we want to think about liberation and freedom, and if expression is an extension of that notion of freedom and liberation, then I don't know if art can participate in making social change. I think that's us. I think we participate in making social change, and art can come alongside or be a part of that process, <laughs> but it's not inherently something that that does wonders for us. We have to do that ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, our social change, it's interesting to look in the 20th century, so the Russian Revolution in the Athens, major social change, the first thing that happens is these artists go nuts to attack and power, and I don't even know all the things that they did, and the typography and the magazines, and the other nuts. Stalin comes in, and maybe before that, and he presses it on. Okay, so then you have why not journey. People are going nuts. Again, the art is wild. Um, it's breaking all kinds of boundaries for periods in. And who comes into power? Hitler. Um, you just don't really know. It's hard to know how it's going to go. It may go right now in a period where social change and art is a major, I don't know what you guys call it. Uh, engineering and medicine, not the arts. 
for history yeah. or well, that's true. Or, 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 or literature, like right. these kinds of yeah. Yeah. humanities. Right. Because it's all about objects and technology and money. Uh, but therefore, what is the arts? And, and I think that in, um, I, and I'm in theater, so you know, it's a little different. Um, I think different music and, and, and fine arts are different than theater. So far as theater uses words in a public setting, and that means ideas. And that's really dangerous. That's why you get like uh, Stalin and Hitler and, 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 and Kanye and Kurt, they really teach the Shakespeare to God's God say. Um, but I also remember working with people in Boston, a group called Urban Improv, were in impoverished neighborhoods of color and um, recreating the dynamics of every election that these people go through. These people, because I don't live that way. And me going like, oh my god, that is what you go through? And it was extraordinary. I learned so much. Now is that going to change the world? I don't know. But it certainly blew my mind. And I do think that. I don't think art inherently is about power. I think it's used often about the, for power of situations and money to live up. But inherently not. I think it's actually the threat to power. I think it's about individual expression and seeing things beyond the norms and speaking up and having people listen, maybe, hopefully, who say, oh, it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. I think that's what the arts really are about. And I think that we have to be careful in our own thinking not to fall into or create our own traps of um, intellectual categories, which, we, which I speak of in a lot the last 20 years, which are trendy, but have a lot of agendas attached because we're trying to prove points with the agenda too often. We're not really paying attention to the dynamics of the problems at hand. Um, I'm very grateful we've got another day, because I didn't think overnight tonight. And the thing I have to think about is, um, it wasn't one moment, but it was 15, 20, 25 years, which happened to coincide with the beginning of Hull House. At the time the Hull House began, there were the a few people who might talk about individual expression, but that's not what art was. Art was a social enterprise. It created guilds, it created markets, it created taste, it created classes, it created group shared experience. Elliot mm -hmm. Starr would not make her books for self expression. Mm -hmm. She made them for the practice of a set of values, and she wasn't teaching self expression. This is not to say there is not a strong foundation for the work you individuals are doing. But I do think that when the arts began in all of us, there was a much more perfect social model of what the arts were. And so to say, let us develop to allow the earnings of otherwise economically vulnerable women a taste for homes that will be more refreshing and wholesome because we get rid of that old, you know, sovereign-based, aristocratic, you know, let's create a whole new world in which dozens and hundreds and thousands of people are part of a different type of culture. That's like, that's the kind of work they're talking about. I mean, Villages full of craft factories. Right, and so, yeah, then you're talking about craft and arts. And, and so there are different, all of this, there's a, a discourse that we have to deal with and, and sort of resist the idea of reducing the complexity of what we're talking about when we talk about participatory arts to one thing or one thing at any given moment in, in the kind of development of the concepts that are here in the room. Um, and so when you're looking at something like art therapy, when I go back to the 70s and look at what 
early art therapists were thinking, the questions they were asking, those are the most appealing questions for me. They're more appealing than the questions that a lot of art therapists are asking today, quite frankly. Um, and, and I find, find that to be the case because of the cultural moment. Because people were, I mean, as much as you might read a more, um, something that might be talking about psychoanalysis or something that might be really trying to get at what we would think of as a theory or some kind of defining art therapy as a science, for me is really about trying to, trying to articulate what's happening. And, and maybe what's emerging in that articulation are social needs. And then what people are trying to do to envision or imagine something different to, to respond to or answer those social needs. And it's not a unanimous voice. People are saying, oh, we should, you know, we should do this because art has the capacity to do, to coming together around art has the capacity to do a particular thing. Some of the people say, no, no, it's psychology. It's really studying the individual mind and what's going on with that. And so I just want to, I want to sometimes resist the impulse to really romanticize the arts and, and romanticize artists as somehow, you know, you know, special seers. Um, because if we if we do that, we disempower ourselves to see what's going on in the present. Because every historical moment is the present. This is a historical moment, right? And so if we have to say that artists can you know, bring about social change in order to think about social change, then for me, I'm, I'm just in the wrong place altogether because I, I need to believe that every single person has a capacity to configure their ideas in a way that can mobilize social change because I can't survive without that. I can't survive without people thinking about themselves as active participants in the, in the world that we're in and active, uh, having an active role in changing that. Here's the, the, the paradox. Go way back to Ruskin. Ruskin would say cows cannot be perfect. But it's not because he's reactionary or conservative or anything. It's because for Ruskin, the act of drawing was an enabler of seeing and therefore relating to the world around you. You know, the particular bit of stonework in Venice the leaf that just fell on the rock and is damper on one side than the other side. And that by drawing it, you see that a cow's, what is a cow, a hide, um, gradually may shift in a mottled way from a matte way to a shiny, right? And so that you see the world through manual observation means the cows can't be perfect. I'm but, yeah. Yeah. However, <laughs> if you are colorblind, does that impose that you can only be seeing it a particular mm -hmm. way? Well, I guess what I would say is that it doesn't matter when the wrong at all. Mm -hmm. It's the, the act of observation, of observation and yeah. of engaging yeah. with the world in that way. Therefore, if a person is colorblind and the cow comes out to be green, the exercise is still I think um, one thing is, I've been working in this all that stuff for like 30 years, you know? Anyway, um, but about a year ago, I just realized something I'd never really prepped before. And that is that, you know, Adam Simstar uses their model in Toynbee Hall in London. And Toynbee Hall was started as a Cambridge or Oxford students, you know, um, wealthy, affluent, privileged uh, English men. Um, mostly. Mostly. But, you know, they were serving the poor of, of London. Then, um, I had two little things. One was, they didn't, they didn't want, I mean, I'm Jewish, and they didn't want to um, serve Jews. So oh. I found that interesting. Yes. And the second part of it was that when Adams and Star came here, 
The big difference between Malthouse and Trinity Farm is they deliberately put themselves in a diverse community. Unlike England and London, by definition, they were working with immigrants from different countries. Now we understand that they're minority minorities we're aware of now that perhaps they weren't dealing with them. That's, that's not the point. The point is that they had to deal with all the dimension called difference. And I think that the difference dimension feeds into all the stuff that you guys are talking about, which has to bring in issues of psychology, in a sense, but it's really sociology. But it's really talking about how, to what degree, should someone who's different become the Americanizable coffee norm? There you go again. Or are they allowed to make, preserve their ethnicity and their identity? Or do they have to find some middle ground between the two? Will Hull House be accepted? We just didn't accept Hull House. Adam struggled like crazy getting involved here. They saw Hull House as a threat. And on the other hand, Italians and Jews and Irish men were eager to come here. So I'm just saying it's so much more complex than her. And that's why the stuff that you guys are talking about and we're all talking about is so minor. Because we're dealing with diversity and immigration issues, you kidding me? You know? Liam, there's a question posed about your work on the West Side, Rectory, and Long Walk Home. Oh, gosh. Um, okay. Uh, where do I start? Okay, I'm from Florida. Um, I, I sometimes introduce myself as someone who's Florida born and West Side born again. <laughs> I refer to the West Side as Chicago's West Side. Uh, I moved here in 2008, uh, the Obama year, um, to uh, study art therapy. Uh, when I moved here, I lived in Boys Town. It was an easy place to live for commuting purposes and being someone not from the city. And then I ended up uh, practicing. My, my first internship was at Michael Reese Hospital, which is now closed. It was then closed and just had people seeking services there. Um, and you know, it was it was a pretty dire situation there. Um, but if people know anything about Michael Reese as a hospital, it, it has a a long history, and specifically as it relates to uh, the art therapies. Um, there, it was sort of the, the I don't know. At some point, it would be the ideal place to work as an art therapist because you had there was a kill, and there was you know there was all kinds of things in this hospital, and there was a time where people could. Uh, you know, art therapy was a part of treatment. You could be there for an extended period of time. Uh, you know, Michael Reese was a city, really. Um, but when I got there, it was a building by that point, and there were, you know, a lot of issues with the building. Um, and there were children there who were something like throwaways based on how the institution would uh, treat these children. So these were children who would have nowhere else to go. So this would probably be step one before they end up at the juvenile detention center. Um, and so this was my introduction to art therapy, and I almost left the field because of that. Um, what I ended up doing was uh, looking for a supervisor. I requested that my field work placement supervisor placed me with a supervisor of color. I felt that at the time my supervisor had no way of describing the systems that made it possible for Michael Reese to be the way that it was um, and to still somehow make money off of black and brown children as this building was crumbling around them. So I ended up working with uh, Shahrazad Tillett, who was one of the co-founders of an organization called A Long Walk Home. Uh, this, the name of the organization is is a line from uh, the other co-founder, her sister, Salamisha Tillich, wrote a poem um, after uh, she uh, went public about her survivorship of sexual violence. And so that year, this was 2009, that year they wanted to take what was a photography performance 
um, that have been traveling from colleges and universities to tell a Salvation's story about surviving sexual violence, they wanted to uh, adapt that program to a youth program, a program for teen girls to uh, deal with uh, adolescents, um, reproductive health, and uh, sexual health, sexual violence, gender-based violence. And so that organization is my introduction really to the west side of Chicago. And so I was in North Lawndale doing work there um, and spent a lot of time to get to know the history of the west side um, and some of the ways that the west side as a, a, a Jewish, that black, black and brown, um, neighborhood really differs from the South Side and some of those similar uh, demographics. And in that in that process, I think what has been really important to me is to uh, really make my practice uh, hyper local. Um, and that's part of where I've gotten a lot of my, um, I guess, the focus of my work really comes from needing to understand a practice through the local context. Um, so I hope that gives some info to answer that question. Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions from the floor? Do you want to add anything else that you want to I have a question. Mm -hmm. in, in doing this project, um, and I'm just going to arts and looking at our therapy and learning about some of the field, the term applied arts, has come up a number of times, and I'm wondering if you all consider it in applied arts and what that means. And if, you know, applied is often seen as a more vulgar form, or you know, taking away from the purity. Or and I just, I want, I'm just interested in how you approach that or disrupt that, or, or you know, think about the utility of the work that you do. This is a practical component of it. Um, I, I think more than some of the other areas of arts that we were researching, um, this one has this kind of not natural discussion, but questions about um, use. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of interested in how you think about it. If you think about it as why is that appropriate? I can share a little. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I'm like, you talk a lot already, but well, I, I, can, I think, yeah, I can answer that. I think that, um, like art education, art therapy will fall underneath applied arts if you understand it as a profession. Um, so, you know, there's art therapy, the idea, and there's art therapy, the profession. And um, so that's an early and important discussion in art therapy as well. Um, but applied arts for me has has to do with a kind of pedagogy. Um, it has to do with, you know, when you start thinking about what something is for. Um, my my pedagogical position is, is to not answer that for other people. <laughs> you know, it's, to, to, to not provide a straightforward response that shuts down the possibilities of what people can can do when they think um, and and uh, and so or, or make as a way of thinking um, and so when you this term I don't really know the origins of the term but I think when people often use it sometimes it just takes a step out of the practice of thinking and theorizing as if there's some sort of natural progression from, so first we think, then we take the thought, and then we make it, then we manifest the thought. <laughs> and I don't understand thinking to happen that way. <laughs> so for me, it's a, more of a pedagogical positioning to, to deal with the applied arts in that way. Was there one other question? Yes. Well, you know, the fire, the process for the artist is the same. I don't think about the process of the naked. But in the time that occupational therapy um, arose, um, even our education, um, education theory was kind of involved in this idea that you should get your hands on things generally 
um, Francis Parker, the idea, and then it was also a time when a city like Chicago was filled with brick makers, um, terracotta makers, um, stained glass makers, all these crafts, they they were arts, but they were crafts at the same time. They might provide a profession for you, they might provide engagement for you, they might just uh, lift your home. And that was where they started in the idea of occupational therapy. Maybe you would get better at doing something so you could go back to work. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the origins, but you know, I want to add this question and I see your, your question. As we're, and this is for all three of you, as we talk about pedagogy and all of you all are, are teachers, instructors, how, but this lends itself more to um, earlier curriculum for young people when we talk about the, the lack of art um, in public school and how do we move it back into a public uh, place of education, the importance of art and the significance that it has on um, citizenship and it has on education. How, because we talk a little bit about social change, but but I'm wondering what, what are practical ways that we can move the conversation forward back into having art better instilled or where, what are we doing now? What are we doing now about that? We're not doing it in private education either. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so what what happens? I think, again, we've talked about this notion of Hall House being a, a place of uh, movement, right? And so how, not just physical movement, but social movement. So how do we move that back into a conversation about schooling and the importance of art and the various ways that art can be manifested? Like, um, the kids that grew up in this neighborhood were impoverished. He had to work for the child. And the reason they're trying to child live a lot is because this neighborhood worked. Mm -hmm. um, but most of them said they were on. Thank God for Hall House because it augmented what their lives would have otherwise been growing up in towns. So it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Because one of the things that Hall House offered were classes in the arts mm -hmm. that they would have otherwise had. Mm -hmm. And this can give people also to teach that it was uh, mm -hmm. so that they didn't have this ironic now because of the mm -hmm. politics and the agendas that it's been just out of the top. And kids who speak in arts language, like the visual you're talking about seeing the movie, right? The visual language, you know, uh, who maybe aren't good with words, mm -hmm. don't have it like that setting anymore to be able to feel good about themselves to tend to explore about the skills in those directions that may lead to the point where certain personal, hopefully better lives as a person, but not professional. I feel like if we had the answer to that, we could solve a lot of problems we even be asking. I mean, I, I would also add the the play to mm -hmm. that whole conversation. I mean, it's a little bit outside of the arts, but also very, very closely related. Um, in occupational therapy, there's a we have in our what we call our framework all the different areas of occupation and play really we see play as the occupation of children and i think that there are some parallels between how art and play are de-emphasized in a lot of school systems um public and private school systems and, and they're both of to me art and play one of the things that's that are similar is it's about self-expression and self-creation um you know whether it's for children or adults um, but how we how we improve or bring that back into being valued and recognized in a regular experience for kids in school. I mean, I think it's the cultural, it's it's that context and culture piece. Um, you know, I think that one way, I don't know, I think it's a really difficult thing to, to figure out, which is why we don't see a lot of movement and why it continues to be like that. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, uh, regarding arts education in Chicago Public Schools, maybe worth adding that um, that as part of the Chicago Cultural Plan uh, from maybe three four years ago, set specific goals for arts education, arts participation in Chicago Public Schools, 
and the creation of Ingenuity, uh, a, a, I think it's technically a private nonprofit, but I think it's quasi-governmental. Uh, I think the, the, there's actually some really hopeful data from that. I just was kind of pulling that, that up. And uh, there's now a ranking. Every Chicago public school gets ranked in terms of its arts program. Um, and the percentage of schools ranked strong or excellent increased from 29% in 2012 to 66% in 2016. Um, the number of arts instructors increased from 2015 to 2017. Um, uh, is now, uh, and the percentage of elementary schools providing 120 minutes of weekly arts instruction uh, went from 40% in 2012 to 60% in 2016. 120 minutes, not a lot. Uh, but uh, but there's there, there's some there's some good I think there's some good movement in, in Chicago in that regard. I'm sorry, I'm probably talking too much. I'm a retired educator, and I have taught a variety of settings. And our education in our country is totally male privilege. It's still vulnerable in suburbs and more economically developed communities. But I am telling you, I have worked at a teacher's private school. And I worked in some of the worst neighborhoods in Chicago, some nice neighborhoods. And it is a product of privilege in our culture. Every suburban district gives lip service and has an art room, a store room for it, and a pottery kiln, and all of this stuff. Sometimes they cut it because they use a referendum or something, but nothing like the way the city treats the kids. I don't care if they say it's 120 minutes, it's 120 minutes. So I so I, I know I know that we're coming we're coming short on time and I do want to at least end a high note. Yeah. As far as what we've had a conversation about, I think what we've had a conversation about is the importance of not only personhood, but community, but then the impact that art has always had and always will have. And so those who are believers in art, art therapy, art expression, we are have been charged, what do we do to move the, the pendulum forward as far as this is where we need to have art be more established in whatever venues that may be um, within the community, communities, centers, similar to Hull House and school areas, but again, it's, it, it falls back on us, and, and Lee, I'm, I'm glad that you, you made that point. It's not just about the art making social change, but it's about us being a part of that conversation. And so with that, I wanna thank our panelists, I wanna thank our audience, and I know we are moving on to the next exciting moment.